There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. Well, so what's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Of course, I am Jay Campbell, and we are in part four of our incredible podcast with Laura Knight Yadchik, and of course, my business partner and good friend, Hunter Williams. Um, the first three episodes of this have been pretty much incredible. So hopefully, uh, as you guys are watching this now, you're somewhat indoctrinated into this mythos. But uh, starting off in today, um, you actually put out an amazing uh, uh, message on, on social media without dialing in about the third man. And you talked a little bit about how as a regression hypno hypnotherapist, um, you're able to prove that people can be hypnotized and told that so-and-so doesn't exist or something does exist. And then when they come out of their hypnosis, due to the hypnotic suggestions, they can't see things anymore for what they really are. And, and you have a brilliant thread about this. And I kind of wanted to just to open up today's show or podcast with the discussion of it, how it relates to how humans choose essentially to be ignorant of what is right in front of their own eyes. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, I wouldn't call myself a, a regression hypnotist. I, I, I've run hypnotherapy and I've done hypnotic regression as a Sorry about that. That's what I meant. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a stickler for being precise. Sure. Um, but, and the experiment wasn't one that I had done. It was, it, it was, it's known in some of the literature of hypnotherapy. And the story is that a person was hypnotized and the suggestion was made that when they came out of the hypnosis, that they would not be able to see this other man, the third person in the room, the third man. So we'll just call him the third man. And so all the suggestions, all the appropriate, you know, strong suggestions were given that he would be invisible. You will not be able to see him, et cetera, et cetera. And then he was brought out of the hypnosis and the suggestions didn't work. And this was apparently a, a fairly good subject who, uh, you know, other suggestions worked with him. So they then tried the experiment in another way. They put him under hypnosis and suggested to him that the third man who was in the room when he went under had to leave on an emergency, you know, suddenly leave. And they described well he's putting on his coat now he's, he's getting his hat you know what etc all the descriptions of him getting ready to leave the room and he did you know did not leave the room but he opened the door and then shut it so that the sound of the door opening and shutting was heard and then he was absolutely silent so then the guy was brought out of the hypnosis and because uh because the you know the suggestions had been made in a, a way that that accorded with his belief system, he couldn't see this third person because he believed the person was gone. The person had left the room, was gone. And they played around with it a bit. The person went around moving objects in the room, you know, which scared the heck out of the, the guy who had been hypnotized. But, you know, he, he still couldn't see him. And that, that always strikes me because, you know, so many so-called paranormal things happen. And you, you just wonder if you were, uh, if, if some part of you was opened up to seeing something else or in addition to what we're more or less programmed to see from childhood, if we would not be able to see what was going on when those paranormal events happened. But in any event, the whole point of the story is, is that, uh, you know, we are programmed with what we can see. And most people, are programmed by their society, their culture, their family. Well, it starts with the family, and then it's which is controlled by the society, and then it moves on to their peers or their government or whatever. And there's so many stories of small children who can see, uh, you know, spirit apparitions, if you want to call it that, or things in other realms, or auras, or any number of things. And then after they grow up, you know, they're, they're repeatedly told that, you know, well, nobody can see that or they learn it by osmosis or they 
get it from impressions, so they stop having the ability to see those things. But the most important thing is, is that in this case, the, uh, the patient, if you want to call him that, chose to believe the hypnotherapist. And therefore, he was unable to see this third man. And we do that all the time. We choose who to believe. And we don't trust in our own uh, sensations. We don't trust in our own, uh, uh, our own eyes or ears or whatever. And we get programmed to the point that, uh, you know, trying to see or believe something that goes against what we have been conditioned to believe is possible or is available actually can cause pain in the brain. I mean, there was, there was a study that um, Barbara Oakley cited in her book, I think it was Mean Genes, uh, where they did, uh, I don't know what kind, exactly what kind of brain scans they were doing, but they determined that when people, you know, tried to confront a really difficult belief and to see the truth about something or to, uh, it was actually done in, in political context when they were confronted with the idea that they're, the person that they had been told was politically bad actually did something good and the person that they you know, supported politically was actually bad, they couldn't stand it. I mean, it actually caused pain in their brain. The same oh, receptors yeah. that light up when you're experiencing physical pain were lighting up in their brains. So there's this, this real problem with perception and with reality and with what we believe and what we uh, should believe or shouldn't believe. And that's really one of the reasons uh, that I wrote the way the way I did. Because as you know, what is it, eight books? Yeah. Okay, it's eight books. And it proceeds little by little by little. You know, I bring up a topic and I, and I worry that topic to death. You know, I bring in all the support and I talk about it from two or three different ways and explain it from two or three different angles and go on. And then, you know, generally I, I kind of would leave them on a cliffhanger at the end of the chapter because when it was going up online, it was chapter by chapter, not book by book. Each book consists of numerous chapters, but these would go up and then I would, you know, go to the next one. And I couldn't plan it because I had originally planned something that was a lot shorter and, and more concise. But as I was writing it, every time I wrote a chapter, I would get multiple emails, people asking, well, what about this and this and this? And I would see, oh God, okay, in the next year, I'm gonna have to cover some of those problems because, you know, so that's why it really is so comprehensive because people were querying me as I was writing. But as you, you see how it goes, and little by little, I try to deprogram people. Right. To bring them, you know, all of these many sources from all of these different angles on particular subjects, you know, supporting scientific evidence or circumstantial evidence or uh, anecdotal evidence. So that by the time they get to the end, they will see the world in a very, very different way. And for this, I got accused of being a cult or. <laughs> trying to start a cult or something, trying to just, I mean, like, for example, uh, on the subject of Marjo Gortner, I don't know if you've ever watched the, the Marjo movie, but if you haven't, you, you really should look it up and see if it's still on YouTube somewhere and watch that movie because he lays open the whole, uh, what do you call it, the evangelical, um, uh, or what do they, what do they call them? So they, they go on these, uh, crusades or whatever, those tent meetings and whatever. So he, he lays open revival, that. Revival. Revival. Revival, revival yeah. Yeah, that's the word I want to, revivals. And, you know, so, I mean, talking about that and I bring up all of, you know, all of these other pieces of evidence of all kinds of things. So anyway, if, if you manage to read all the way through the waves, you probably will be end up being deprogrammed from a lot of false beliefs about our reality. And I, I hope that was the experience that you had because that was kind of the intention was to. I mean, Laura, and I'm not saying this to blow smoke up your ass, but I will blow smoke up your ass. It's literally the most incredible 
book series that I've ever read in my life. I mean, as Hunter, and I know Hunter agrees with me, as we were reading it, we would have to stop at times and like go outside and meditate. Yeah. I get, I get a lot of that too. People write and tell me that when they start reading this, that strange anomalous things begin to happen in their lives. And, you know, it's like, it's like the energy of their awakening stirs things. Mm-hmm. And those things try to put them back to sleep by frightening them, you know, and let's face it. Some of the things that are in the wave series are scary as all get out. I mean, you know, it's it's frightening. So uh, through, a, through a glass darkly and uh, almost human, like when we start finding out about the psychopaths and just the undergrounders, and you know, I don't want to transition to another question, but we had Hunter and I had things that happened in our own personal life that we were dealing with that was like, oh my god, <clears throat> without without well, now, bringing it up and talking about. It. Yeah, well, now we look back and it was very much a third man phenomenon going on with people that were either clients of ours or people that we had different business things that we did with where it was we were able to see that for what it was but like you said we had to more or less deprogram ourselves to be able to witness the true nature of reality because like you said if someone pays you money and they claim that they get good results and they are like interacting with you on a regular basis it's hard to acknowledge that that person may be an agent unwillingly or willingly or may have bad intentions for you. And so you have this cognitive dissonance. What I wanted to ask you too, in regards to that. So now that we know we have these parts of our brain that we resist hearing things that are contradictory to our belief center that was installed on us, do hyperdimensionals understand that and then set up a construct that is able to harvest energy from us because of the way that our brains work in, in order to, whether it's like for their own self, like energetic, pro, you know, like propagation or whatever. I would say so. I, I, I mean, the seas and some of the earliest sessions said some really frightening things. And one of them was that these hyperdimensional type beings, um, feed on the energy of fear and suffering. Um, or at least the energy of fear mainly. And, and I, I would have to say suffering too. And they uh, somehow absorbed this. I mean, they also pointed out that in some cases, some, some of these types of, of beings, like some of the, the bi-density beings, you know, bathe in a, a slurry of, of human products and absorb energy through their form because they don't consume food. Uh, so, you know, and you think about something like that and you, and you think about all of the millennia of human sacrifice. Right. That has, has, you know, taken place around the planet for a very long time. And then you begin to understand, you know, why people thought that sacrifice fed the gods because it probably literally did did yes and uh yeah so well isn't that you know to to not change topics but i think it's interesting and again without talking about from paul to mark the bible has all these like illusory veiled references to sacrificing firstborn you know put the put the stuff on the mantle or the top of the, you know, not the roof, but the top of your door. I mean, all of these things going back in the old Testament. I mean, aren't these all veiled references to basically reptilian beings eating humans? Well, do they necessarily have to be reptilian? No, it could be humans, giants, you know, I mean, cannibals. A lot of people, they really get focused on the, on the reptilian thing because it's, it's pretty shocking. And it's, you know, it's like, it, it's good Hollywood, but, yeah. Yeah. but let's face it, there's, there's a lot more going on. And, and, and I think the, I think the, the she said at one point that the reptilians were actually subservient to the, to the tall Nordic types, you know, a, a version of them. 
so um yeah there are, there's also a lot of the literature in there it, it's it's left over from the times when when israel was polytheistic and they were involved in the same canaanite sacrifice as everybody else was which really lasted up until the time of the maccabees i would say that the only time that, uh, that anything about uh, biblical israel was a reality with uh, at that time because before that it was just you know scattered city states and so forth but having said that the whole sacrifice thing yeah that uh it's an unpleasant topic and it's going on right now i mean look at what they're doing to right. her with this transgender ideology uh look at the wars that are going on i mean what's going on in gaza is a huge human sacrifice absolutely I mean, it's almost it's it's satanic and what's right. going on in in ukraine is satanic but then those are just the two real big hot spots right at the moment this stuff goes on i mean it rotates around the planet here there everywhere I mean, there have been places in Indonesia, places in, you know, here, there, and everywhere. But I'd say that right now, this is kind of like the first time since the Civil War that it's really been a big human sacrifice in America. And make no mistake about it, transgender uh, activities, uh, turning children, you know, into what, it, what they're not. Is is child sacrifice? I mean, there's those people are sacrificing their children to Moloch. Yes. So, who who is Moloch? If if we can, you know, go as far as venture, because obviously, you know, we hear the stories of obviously we know who Lucifer is from the Cassiopeians telling us it's basically the collective of third density humans who have fallen in consciousness. Is Moloch, you know, obviously we have the word Satan and we have Shaitan and all these different words like. Who is Moloch relative to that myth mythos? Well, I, I don't think I ever really, I probably looked him up on Wikipedia once or twice, but uh, let me see if I ever mentioned him in the sessions. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting, Hunter, because John Baines in Stellar Man talked about that being. No, I didn't. No, That I was didn't. incarnated into third density. That was like a great demon slash discarnated entity who is of pure evil well there there are so many of them um yeah you know I, what their names are what their ranks are um you know that's that's a whole that's a whole other realm of study the book of enoch um lists lists, lists them by name and the uh dead sea scrolls have have made reference to people whose job it was to keep track of the list of the fallen angels or the demons or whatever. And it was their area of expertise to know who they were, what their names were, what their specialties were and so forth. So that's a, that's a whole other, you know, it's a whole other realm of study, but Moloch, it was, um, Canaanite God. And I think his favorite snack was babies. Right. And the deal was that, you know, if you give Moloch your firstborn, the dearest thing to you, you know, in the world, theoretically, uh, then Moloch will reward you with a, a wonderful, bountiful life and so on and so forth. And that comes through in the Old Testament. Uh, and they even talk about, you know, offering offering their children on high places and so forth. But it got transmogrified in a sense for the Jews instead of sacrificing their children, which they actually were doing most of the time, like I said, up until, you know, fairly late. But they, they modified it and it became circumcision. Right. And instead of instead of burning the baby, they whacked his peepee. -pee, you know? So well, <clears throat> well, is that is circumcision is the modern day transgender more or less a circumcision of children because you have children with this like very pure energy that come into the world and then you have parents or society or whoever it is that's confusing them about their gender identity which confuses their like energetic centers that ends up i wanted to ask you do, this is more of just like a future prediction question what does it look like 30 years from now where you have these children that are being installed 
a software set in their brain of being transgender or being non-binary or whatever it is, what, how does that play out in society 30 years from now when these kids become adults? I society to survive that long. Right. I went. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, I, I, I don't think you can have people that hate themselves that much because that's what that ends up doing to them is it causes I mean, like a very. Can you imagine a parent right. imposing that ideology on a, on a small child and they, and you know, they show up in these little clips from TikTok that get, you know, put on Twitter or X all the time. Oh, uh, you know, and some of these Hollywood people that have two or three children that are, are transgender. I'm telling you, if you have two or three children that are transgender, the children aren't the ones with the problem. Right. It's the parents. Right. Right. And all these, well, a lot of these famous celebrities, Laura, are made to do this. Like it's part of their oaths. It's part of their selling of whatever their soul or their, their spiritual identity or the, the spiritual center, whatever is going on. There's so much craziness in Hollywood, but. It, it actually stands to reason when an adult is doing this, not a non-celebrity, and it could, you know, be a celebrity or person too. Are they, because in your book, and I can't remember which one it was, and I think it was book six, it's book five or book six. I have so many notes, but uh, one of the books that you had read, and I know there's thousands, but you talked about, they were identified as each human being can have three attachments at any point in time. And my question would be, are these transhumanist parents that are giving their children this identity, are they under the influence of, you know, dis disincarnated or di demonic entities that are forcing this? Let me clarify. I think I said something along the line that I had never encountered anybody who had, you know, who didn't have some kind of spirit attachment. Sure. And the average was three to five. Okay. That's right. That's what I was going for recollection. Yeah. I didn't remember if you said that or if it was one of the books that you had read that you had quoted. That's, that's been, and it still holds true. And I've done spirit release, you know, not too long in the past, you know, it was fairly, and uh, sometimes up to seven, eight, you know, whatever entities. And they, they aren't all necessarily uh, discarnate humans, you know, who, some of them are elemental type energies, only in a few cases, very, very few cases, because let me tell you, I wouldn't be continuing to do it if it was very often. Have they been actually demonic? I mean, really, you know, scary, scary shit. I mean, right. that stuff, right. that's, you know, that stuff makes me you know, pull out the hairspray. Well, you said you did one, you did an exorcism and it took you, took like, it cost you like, like affected you physically for a couple of six months, six months. Yeah. It took me an hour wow. months to get over it. It was so, I, I don't even know how to explain it. It's that when you confront that kind of darkness, it like, it's like getting too close to a black hole and it, and, and maybe you're like, if, if you could describe yourself as some kind of like a star-like object that has a lot of gases and stuff and you get too close to this black hole and it sucks a bunch of it off of you, that's kind of what it feels like. It sucks something off of you. I mean, almost like it's taking some of your flesh off and you're, you're being eviscerated. So it, it uh, I mean, I spent a lot of time during that period just sitting in a rocking chair with my feet up you know, just rocking because, you know, that's all I could do was like, oh my God, oh my God. And it was yeah. this from a man or a woman? A man. Do you, I mean, if, you, if you're not comfortable talking about it, we don't have to. Obviously, I'm fascinated. I'm sure Hunter is too. But is, do you, is there a reason why some people become inhabited by unspeakable evil? A reason why that's something that, you know, I've, I don't think I exactly have an answer for that because I've asked it because this, this guy, he actually got this attachment during sex. Cool. You know, it went from the woman to him and it, uh, I don't know. Was there something about him? I, I, I didn't know enough about him, his history. Uh, the best you can do to find out 
some more details or deeper details, read like Malachi Martin's Hostage to the Devil. I've read that. It's yeah. A profound book. Yeah, he can he gives you some ideas. But why are these I mean, why children? Sometimes it's children. I mean, not that often. It's extremely rare. I mean, don't get the idea that this is something that happens a lot. It's it's rare, but it happens. What is it about a child, an innocent child, that makes them, you know, susceptible to that sort of thing? But then you stop and think, well, that child is not necessarily an innocent child if you consider reincarnation. Right. Who was that individual in a previous life? And was there something about their previous life or several previous lives that made this inevitable or possible or probable in this life, even though they are a child? Um, those things you have to consider. And each case would necessarily be somewhat different. You can't say that there are, are rules about it. So, so, it, it, so, so, so the, 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 the question that I would have from off of that of thinking about reincarnation, like what allows us, and I know this is a, probably a difficult question to even answer, but I think it's fascinating to think about like, if we're, if we all three of us believe in reincarnation, and I think most of us do, um, how are we ascending, not ascending densities, but ascending through frequency resonance vibration from lifetime to lifetime. So again, based on the things that we've experienced, the things that we've done, good or bad. I mean, again, I know those are just labels that we, we give, but is that something that we're just every lifetime we go from where we left off to a higher level of consciousness or is it, are we choosing, because again, the new age is so rife with nonsense. Are we choosing different experiences just because we can? Probably a little bit of both because you know, I, I've had several um, episodes of past life recall and one of them was particularly intense. It went on for days. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. the memories, you know, just, it was like my whole, the whole middle of my body had just been blown open and, and the winds of time were blowing through me. It was sure. pretty bizarre. And the memories, and they were like memories that I have in my head of memories of this life, you know, where you have, you know, a, a consistent set of memories. But I had memories. And if I had just a piece of a memory from one lifetime, if I held that for a second, it expanded to the whole life. And I knew like in a, in a, in an instant, the gestalt of that whole life and, and what my experience had been. And several of them were pretty, pretty, uh, upsetting because, you know, uh, you don't like to think of yourself as a, a Mongol warrior, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hacking people to bits and 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 that sort of thing or or some kind of a but that's that was one of them and and another one was you know some chinese guy there was a, a teacher you know really a long time ago i mean like probably a thousand years ago and you know being aware of that whole life and of being banished and being you know living in the country alone and then there were you know then there was being a, a a nun in in italy and being walled up for lascivious behavior yeah lascivious <laughs> well just just so you know i i hunter share i've had that experience hunter knows i mean i when the first time that i in this lifetime when i walk into the yucatan I had this incredible flashback and it lasted for five minutes and I was so insanely like bonkers over it because I was like, I didn't know how to explain it and I didn't want to like tell anyone, but I was a shaman like in the jungles of the Yucatan. I had like the black paint on my face and there was like a bunch of, you know, uh, indigenous, uh, Mayans, I would assume around me. And it was like, you know, I was in this great brush clearing. I mean, it was, it was such a profound experience that my body like felt it it was like visceral oh yeah I and then you don't really know how to explain it to anybody right because it's not a conversation <laughs> no it's not something that people normally sit around and talk about um i mean like the one i when i when i had the memory of my immediately previous life in nazi germany you know and, and committing suicide by throwing myself out a window 
um you know that was pretty pretty heavy duty and i mean it 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 took me to my knees right well it's as far as the past lives go I've had definitely because I've done past life meditations myself. I've never done it under a hypnotist, but I've done it myself. And whatever's going on there is very real. It's very vivid. And it's very, like Jay said, visceral. I wonder, do the people that we have life experiences with, could the C's have mentioned this idea of like a soul family? Do the people that we have life experiences with from lifetime to lifetime, do we have this like soul family that we end up finding each other somehow, some way in the next time? you know, in the next go round in life, or do we reincarnate with like the family that we choose to incarnate with? Like, I'm sure a lot of us have felt very close to some family members and other family members. Like we're how, how do we come from the same lineage? Do we like group together? And is it more of a soul family? That's not necessarily like our biological family. If you were tracing ancestry. Well, it, I think there's a lot to the soul family thing, but you don't always get together with all the same members all the time. I mean, I think it depends on what has to be worked out and um and what the incarnational options are available because you know we have uh one of our members here that uh we asked that question you know wh why was i born to this family that i don't feel any uh connection to whatsoever and, and it's just that you know you intended to be you know to come in and that was the closest fit to the necessary DNA options that you required. So that's where you came. And then, you know, then as a young man, he found his soul family. Soul families are extremely important, I think, because even if you don't have all of them present all the time, I think you have some of them present most of the time or all the time. And uh, it, uh, you know, people, people, sell themselves short they cheat themselves when they don't really engage with soul family and they get programmed into this you know blood family is the important thing da, da, da. because you know if you don't have anything in common with your blood family um and you have a lot more in common with other people you know who's your real family and interestingly this this is uh this was a perspective that was put into the mouth of jesus in the gospel of mark you know who are my brother and sisters you know who are my you know he, he repudiated his family and said you know the who are my mother who are my who are my brothers those who do the will of god so that's the idea of a soul family is pretty clearly it's explicated in that little bit so yeah it's it's really mind blowing when you think about it. I think I told you guys off air, or maybe it was in the first show, that like I'm the oldest of nine children, and I have no, no nothing in common with any of them. And they think I'm insane. You know, I mean, I could give you a lot of other things they think, but like there's just no commonality. And you know, so I was always liking it. Well, it was you know, obviously there's DNA. There is DNA. You said that, but there's. I don't know. The awareness is just so separate and so differentiated, but I've always just likened it to, you know, I read the Neville got not Neville Goddard. Uh, what's the guy, the power of now dude. You know, I'm sure Eckhart he's Tolle or whatever. Eckhart Tolle. You know, I read his <laughs> book. <laughs> New York I'm Times sure he's, you know, part of the, you know, new age go and tell pro himself, himself, but there's, you know, some interesting stuff in that book, like 12 years ago. And, you know, it was about the whole idea that you chose your parents because it was the greatest opportunity for contrast, which, you know, ultimately leads to inner growth and wisdom acquisition. So that's what I, you know, put it in my head that that's why I chose them. But then there obviously there is the DNA component. And my father is a very, very extremely intelligent person, not aware, but, you know, book smart, you know, very learned, highly educated, but you know, so there were some DNA there, but it is, it is fascinating to really think about that. Like why we do choose our parents, especially in people that are like truly hyper aware and really do walk this path. And we look at our, our brothers and sisters, you know, or our closest family members and we're like, you know, obviously we get to a place where we know it's not about awakening them. It's not our purpose, but you know, we kind of think like, what is it that you don't see that I do? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a big puzzle, but you know, like I said, sometimes you you're looking for the uh, for a certain you know you're resonating for a certain DNA combination, and 
sometimes you have to take the closest thing you can get if you really have a, a, a determination to incarnate or if there is a necessity for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, something that comes as close as possible. But I mean, right there, you have just described the the situation that makes it clear that the soul makes a whole lot of difference because when the soul incarnates in a body, it can change the DNA too. Right. And if it's close enough, it can change it to what it needs. Right. You see? Uh, so if, if it's close enough and if you're if the family that you were born into was close enough, then you could utilize it and still not be, you know, in any way um, connected to those people. And I, I know the idea of, you know, you choose your parents and this and that and the other thing, but I'm not sure that that's exactly the way it happens. And I think it's more what the seed said that you choose that your, that your frequency is seeking a frequency match in right. terms of DNA. And, and that's what it, what it goes for. And sometimes that can also include that you have, you know, soul family members in your actual blood family. But more often, I think you don't. Yeah, I agree. And that's part of the path. Well, it's, right? it's interesting, too. Them. I think, Laura, I may be completely misquoting this, but when you were talking about your past life in Nazi Germany, was that the one where you your brother was also someone that you met that was not your brother in this lifetime that you ended up having a relationship with? Not a relationship, but I, I think he was like in uh, – one of the communities or something back in the nineties. Well, actually there were, there were two, I think there were two discussed in the, uh, in the sessions and possibly in the wave. I don't remember exactly, but there was the uh, past life in Germany. And then, uh, there was another past life in Germany or even older times, like, you know, 1700s or something like that. I think that's what it was. Sorry. I was misremembering. It was a long, yeah. That's okay. where I had a brother who now, I encountered in this life. Um, yeah. So, so there were the two. So you, you, I've you, always, you enter, I've always you, wondered. Go ahead. No, I've just always wondered about that with like our parents and then our brothers and eventually our kids. If in other lifetimes, they were different relationships with us. Like if our parents, if we were their parents or brother and sister or something like that, that's always been fascinating to to me too in regards to past life yeah well you know my brother is uh he's a pretty smart guy you know he's been at some of the sessions and he was there the session talking about you know uh wars being used to abscond with individuals to put them into right. places and he was the one that was asking some of the sharpest questions and you know so he just you know slipped right into it and knew what was going on knew how to ask questions and you know, he's a pretty sharp guy, but, you know, he doesn't have, he doesn't have something that I have, which is, uh, and I guess it's because I'm, I'm a woman and, and he's, you know, he's fairly content to stay out of interfering with anybody's life. And I spend all my time interfering with people's lives, <laughs> <You know? laughs> in a sense, uh, because, writing books and so forth, that's interfering in people's lives. You know, he doesn't have that kind of motivation. And I think that comes from the, the whole nurturing thing that women have. For me, yeah. I think the driver for me is the drive to nurture because, you know, I just never, I never wanted to tell my children lies and I didn't want to teach them anything that wasn't true. And I knew that if, if that was something I, I wanted to fulfill, I had to know something first because how can you teach somebody something if you don't know anything? Right. So when they would ask me a question, I would you know try to find out the the truest possible answer, and I and I knew even then the truth was a very elusive thing. That you know a long time ago the truth was that the the sun traveled around the earth. That's what everybody believed, and that's what everybody would have taught. But it wasn't the truth. So there. Are, we live in a similar situation. We know a certain amount of truth, but there can be greater truths revealed. Right. 
Well, I like, I like how you said that though, about knowing truth. Like, you know, I don't want to get into a long rabbit hole story, but like I learned early on in this lifetime about vaccinations and it's a very bizarre story and how I learned, but it was like, I knew once I found out, and this is in my early twenties, you know, 24, 25, way before I had children, I had my two daughters, but I was like, they will never be vaccinated. There's absolutely no way I will ever allow them to be vaccinated. And so, you know, make a long story short, it's been this like driving motivation in my life. And, and again, I don't want to rabbit hole on that, but it's, it's interesting to like, once you do find out different levels of things, there are certain things that, like you said, it's kind of imperative as a parent to make sure to insulate your children from having to have a deal to deal with that experience, but it's just part of an unraveling. Yeah. Yeah. But then I've learned that the problem is with trying to insulate your children is they don't want to be insulated. I know. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the thieves asked me, you know, would you, would you not want your child to learn how to ride the bicycle? How do they learn a bicycle? How to ride a bicycle by, by riding the bicycle. And of course they're, they're going to fall down a few times. And uh, you think about all the things you learn. I mean, yeah, you want to try to insulate them from some of the biggest horrors, but God, they, they don't want to be insulated. They want to get out there and learn on their own. And you know, my, I mean, I have five. Yeah. And um, it's, it's, it's different. And, and you can't, you can't determine the needs of another. You can as when as a parent, you have to. It's your job to do that up to a certain point, you know. Yeah. To protect your children, but at, at, after a certain point, when they you know get to be at the age of reason, you have to start kind of gradually letting go of those things. It's really hard for me. It's really really hard for me. Well, you have such a strong maternal, you know, instinct, you know, as a mother. And I do it too. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, you know, I have a very, I'm very, I'm very connected to my feminine energy. Um, and it took a lot of work to do that. And that's because I was so disconnected from my mom. Um, but I understand it. I mean, I, I, I can't obviously say that I understand it like a woman does. Uh, but I do feel like I've been a woman in past lifetimes. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the reason that I have such a strong connection to it. But but you're right. I mean, you really do want to protect your children from the things that you know to be bad, but it is very difficult with the environmental stressors. And again, the third man syndrome and, you know, just, just the, the cultural mores uh, that we are forced and indoctrinated to learn. I mean, it, you know, I mean, I think about the seas talking about the strobe light, you know, the television, and obviously now it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous, all the screens, all the tech, everything is part of it. Yeah, and then, I mean, somebody once quoted to me some saying about, you know, having children is like you know, freaking your heart out of your chest, giving it legs and let it walk around in a room full <laughs> of knives. And you know, that's really what having children is like, because, I mean, you just, I mean, some of the greatest traumas of my life have been because of, or, you know, things that happened with my children. Jesus. <sighs> I mean, I, I wake up in a cold sweat sometimes thinking about some of the close calls. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. 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 Well, it's funny because my daughter's texting me right now as you're talking to me about a, 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 a Chuck engine light. <laughs> she just got her car, you know, three months ago. So it's like, okay, baby, I'm on a podcast, you know, but um, yeah, you, you, you do. I mean, as a parent, as a good parent, as a parent that actually is you know, truly loving and concerned about your children, you, you, you desire the best for them from a well being standpoint, but you also have to, like you said, crap, balance it with the idea that you can't protect them and cover them up, you know, to shield them from life that they have to learn. And so there's a balance. It's, everything is, it, it seems to me that in third density, everything is a balance. It's like walking a tightrope, but at the same time, like understanding that there's got to be some lax in the rope. There really is. There's, there's a lot about balance to it. But, uh, um, you know, I think that's enough on the subject of children. Boy, my kids are going to watch these. <laughs> I don't want to say too much. Thankfully, my thankfully my daughters are too still too much into TikTok. <laughs> 
Uh, all right. Well, let's say let's say the cloning because we were kind of talking about it in 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 vague veiled ways about entity attachments and stuff. But obviously, the seas have told us, told you, told us through the reading of your work that the, the cloning has been going on a long time. Um, yeah. Can you can you kind of talk about like what it what they've how they've defined it? Well, it seems like what they were talking about mainly was. Uh, uh, Apparently, a lot of the so-called aliens that get seen uh, were cloned, and supposedly a lot of human beings who have been abducted have had specimens taken from them to clone. <laughs> and I think that some part of that is involved in, you know, they clone an individual and then they accelerate their growth so that they uh, get to be an equivalent age <laughs> and they do things to or with your your cloned match and those things that they do to or with them you know then can affect you in this reality and and of course this is in another reality uh probably in hyperdimensional space but you know there's that going on and then there is uh probably cloning multiple copies of some particular individual who um, would be uh, useful for various purposes. I mean, maybe like warriors or, you know, uh, or just ordinary workers and that sort of thing. But the problem with cloning is, and this goes back to what we talked about before, you know, functional understanding and experiential understanding. Uh, functional understanding is very robotic. And if what they're after is robotic type creatures, that's kind of what they're getting. If they want something with experiential understanding, and I think that's one of the th th things that they are, uh, one of the reasons they are fascinated, or, or I wouldn't say fascinated, one of the reasons they are using human beings is because many human beings, if not you know 50% of them, have individuated souls. Um, and I, that's going to be kind of a, a shocking thing to say because a lot of people think that everybody has a soul. We're, we're inculcated with that idea, you know, for all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Um, but it seems that it's not necessarily so, that there are a lot of uh, people, human beings, who are just possessors of functional understanding because they're they're evolutionary creatures in a sense and that that's a whole other topic so don't get me off on the whole evolution thing <laughs> um yeah so they um they're interested in us and they're interested in getting i think a lot of bodies prepared for them to incarnate into or at least bloodlines set up that will produce infants that they can incarnate into in a uh in a less third density realm because they are, they're planning this whole takeover at the transition to fourth density so they're setting things up all over the place and they're also and in order to do that they have to set up their controls over humanity in third density before it, you know, transitions. So that's why there's so much concentration on, on all this stuff right now, because we're in that transitional uh, phase. So, um, yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of different things going on, cloning for different reasons, uh, sometimes cloning for body parts, uh, sometimes cloning for servants, cloning for uh, women to bear infants and you know that kind of goes back to the incarnational options of dna you know they want to have the right options available you know for their own incarnational uh, experiments and you know in the in the dna for a hyperdimensional person would necessarily be uh, somewhat different than ours or Perhaps the real story is, is that ours was originally uh, fourth density DNA, but it has been suppressed or it has been 
truncated in some way so that it doesn't function as it originally was intended to. So, yeah, there's, uh, uh, you know, I had this really interesting thought one day when I was on the treadmill at the gym, uh, and I was thinking about all the stories of vampires and werewolves, you know, uh, werewolf forms. A uh, vampire has, you know, strange things and he survives on blood and and different other were creatures that transform in, in a very short period of time. I mean, according to the movies, it happens in minutes, but right. that's not necessarily true. But I thought about that and I thought about the fact that, you know, our stomach lining replaces itself once, what, every 24 hours or something. And, uh, and <clears throat> all the cells in our body replace themselves, uh, you know, at different rates. I think the pancreas is pretty fast because, uh, you know, the, the hormone or the bile and the bile salts and so forth kind of chew that up pretty quick. So we have all different parts of our body that replace themselves. And they're controlled by, by, you know, genes that either turn things on or turn things off. And it occurred to me that, you know, this whole story about these transitions of these werewolves could have been stories of, of individuals whose DNA uh, was some portion of their DNA that wasn't normally operative was turned on. And you know that, I mean, for example digestive things they're, they're creatures that have uh, a steady diet of one kind of food and they produce the enzymes or the digestive juices or whatever to digest that particular food and if that food is taken away and they are put in an environment with a completely other kind of food their dna upregulates the kind of gene that can digest this new food and it downregulates the one that was operational for the previous kind of food so that they can now digest something new and different. You know, upregulation and downregulation of genes is, is, is what we're looking at here. So if, um, if we can transform into hyperdimensional beings who have greater mental control of our physiology, and if that could happen from the upregulation of a set of genes that would turn that ability on, we could literally transform, you know, as they say, in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, or I think it might take a little longer than that, but, you know, the, the point is it'd be fairly quick. Um, so those things are possibilities for transformation, but those kinds of things, you know, come only after a long period of work or after a period of preparation, or if you're at the right uh, FRV, frequency resonance vibration. And then the CE said, very important, because I was asking some questions about this at, at one point during the sessions. And I said, receivership capability, mm -hmm. the important thing. Because if the external frequency were to change in a certain way, and if an individual had receivership capability, that itself could upregulate or downregulate certain genes, which also leads to the thought, and you're going to get a, an example of how my brain works here, of what these crazy waves that they're sending out, such as HARP, you know, the 5G, right. um, microwave radiation, the, you know, Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi or whatever people want to call it, those kind of things. Those things, I think, are capable of upregulating or downregulating genes. And I think that's the scariest thing about them. Um, and I mean, that's not even adding in a, a, a vaccine that's got mRNA that, you know, obviously can turn genes on or off depending on what the person has to begin with. I mean, when that thing gets in there, it starts unpacking itself. And depending on what it finds in your cell, what kind of DNA, it can do all kinds of different things. And some of them are really scary. So uh, anyway, that's enough. Well, 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 to that, I want to I unpack that further because that was amazing. <laughs> 
So is it possible that some of us, and I'm not saying it's us, but some of us are quote unquote, sixth density beings, fourth density beings, service to others. And we are somewhat insulated energetically around our FRV or our soul, our spirit body or our spirit center, whatever, from that type of contamination and harm. And that's what shields us. I mean, I know this is a hypothetical. I would say that probably no, because if when you incarnate into the physical body, you're subject to its limitations. Right. And one thing that does come through, however, is, is that you have and, and you and you can't remember. Right. The veil of forgetfulness. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that the one thing you have, and this is something that came through in the raw material, he said that what you do have as a form of protection is a bias. Right. You have a bias towards truth. And that bias compels you to keep, you know, pushing, searching, seeking, uh, researching, all that sort of thing. But if you if you don't get the truth the first time, you keep asking and you keep pushing. And that ability is what it, it, that's what insulates you. Because if you learn how to I mean, you're not going to just magically be able to protect yourself. You're going to have to learn how to take care of your body. Right. You're going to have to learn, you know, what you can and can't eat. You're going to have to learn, you know, what kind of medicines, you know, are allowed and what are not. Um, you know, all those different things to prepare yourself for this receivership capability. And you have to learn how to work with your own internal chemicals and, you know, as, as I pointed out to somebody else recently, the Caesar said that addition, in addition to uh, suffering, feeding for sensitivity, when you experience suffering, it can change your DNA. And I mean, we, we can understand that. I, I even downloaded a paper recently. No, they fit it. <clears throat> Well so, so, well, so Laura, I just want to add something to that. Isn't that the dark night of the soul, technically? Or but yeah. the suffering can be ongoing. Pain processing in the human nervous system. It's selective review of nociceptive and biobehavioral pathways, and this goes into the into the chemistry of pain and suffering. You know, what kind of chemicals the brain releases? What is what is you know, so because I really want to understand, you know, what kind of chemistry is going on, what what uh, receptors are being bound when you when you're doing that. So I'll get into that later. But anyway, um, so you have to understand that you know, working on this, Gertrude you call it conscious suffering. Mm -hmm. When you suffer for a reason, when you when you choose to suffer, and sometimes conscious suffering is as simple as keeping your mouth shut when you really want to tell somebody off or keeping your mouth shut when somebody has got, you know, the center of attention and you feel like, well, you know, I got a better story than he's got. I can tell my story and I'll, you know, leave him in the dust. And you don't need to do that. You know, sitting back and, you know, controlling yourself and letting somebody else have the, the spotlight is, and you learn that as a mother though, you know, that's, that, that's mother stuff. You let your kids have the spotlight. But um, that was my my mom was amazing at that. She had nine children, so she had to like allow her kids to have their you know their say, literally and yeah. figuratively. Yeah. So, but anyway, it can get a lot more complicated than that, and it can get heavy really fast. And we have numerous threads on our forum where we're discussing those types of things, you know, and the. The use of of the uh, negative half of the emotional center, and how receiving shocks can, you know, momentarily put you in a state where you can induct energy from your higher centers if you can keep the heat below your neck. You know, <clears throat> so yeah, there's a lot of Laura, One thing I wanted to ask you in regards to the DNA. So, <clears throat> with we have harp and we have these things, and I kind of made me think back to playing sports. So the coaches, you know, when you play football or whatever, you could even look at maybe like military training. They put you through these really, really tough simulated events 
in order to be able to prep you for what's going to happen in a game or a competition or whatever. And if you didn't go through those suffering events, you would never be ready to go through a game and would never actually be able to achieve stuff. And then what happens is you have, you know, a football team with a hundred guys, only 11 will end up being on the field at any time. And they put everyone through those same events to see who's got the chops to be able to stand up to that because they know they're going to have to go through hard stuff in order to win a game and have the, you know, eventual success or whatever. So I was thinking with, with the DNA, we have harp and we have all these things we we know none of us are going to go down and pick at the government and say, Hey, can you take harp down, please? Obviously that's not going to happen. Is it a way for, I don't know, in a roundabout way, is it a way for us to have to recognize that, understand what's happening to our DNA and then have us grow so that we kind of zig when they zag to be able to turn on our DNA, it eventually maybe helps us get into the next density. Meanwhile, a lot of other people will never do that. They'll never do what is necessary. They'll never learn what to eat. They'll never learn what they have to do to make themselves healthy. They'll never learn to keep their mouth shut. Is that a way that we're going through this like separation process of like some people are getting you know, one way and then other people or all the, I guess the question is, are all those like teasing mechanisms to find out who's made to ascend and then other people just have to fall to the wayside? In, in a sense, yes. Uh, first of all, things like playing hardcore sports or whatever, uh, military training, you know, those sorts of things, those are probably excellent ways to get in some really good hands-on suffering. You know, you need that. You need that suffering. Um, raising children is another good way to get the good yeah. hands on suffering. Um, physical physical issues. You know, I mean, I've suffered my entire life because I've got this. this I've got a screwy mutation. The mutation is is uh, it's a bad thing, but then all the it also makes my nervous system extremely sensitive, which is what makes me able to do what I do. Um, but you know, getting the suffering in opens up DNA, or it turns on DNA, or, or upregulates, or down, or downregulates some, or upregulates some. You know, you, there there are no studies on these kind of things to you know prove what is being done. And of course, every individual is genetically unique, so you can't make hard and fast rules about it. But that is happening, and as you continue to work, like with your mental control over your body, but because let's face it, sports things, you know, hardening of uh, people who play sports or, or do sports or, or in military training, whatever, you know, those eventually become mind over matter kind of things. I mean, you know, my son-in-law ran a, ran a marathon, you know, back whenever it was. And I, that always impresses the heck out of me. You know, because he's he's just, you know, I mean, running a marathon for for somebody with you know mitochondrial uh, issues. I mean, that just that just blows my mind. So, but he trained and trained and trained, and then he ran many, 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 many miles. I don't even remember it was in Ireland, so I don't remember how many miles it was. But that was that was impressive as heck. But um, the point is, is that. We can change our DNA through certain activities, and we can do it in our normal, regular life. I mean, that's why Gurdjieff called his way the fourth way, because you work, you work with where you are. You don't have to go off and be a yogi. You don't have to go off and be a monk, and you don't have to be a, you know, a faker that controls his body or a monk that controls his emotions or a yogi that controls his mind. You can work on all the centers at work once in your daily life with the situation you are presented in your daily life. I mean, because most of us, when we first start to wake up, we find it, it's like waking up in the middle of a freaking battlefield. Right. I don't know how the hell you got there. I mean, you wake up and you, what is going on and what am I <laughs> doing here? It still happens to me. Yeah. Yeah. So, those things can be protective and you can also uh, upregulate things that can protect against the 5G. Awareness is a really big one, just being aware of it. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, like we'll sit around here and if we, we talk about our dreams, okay? I had a dream last night, blah, blah, blah. And well, I had one and blah, blah, blah. And then you start noticing the similarities between the dreams. And then we sit down, we look at each other. Yeah, they turn our power, you know, because it's, it's, you know, something that's going on. And then you start noticing. And this is one of the reasons why we watch the news and participate in that so much. Because listen, this is an important point. Figuring out the truth is one of the most important exercises you can put your mind to. What do we have to practice on? Our reality, the world around us, the political reality, the social reality. You know, I mean, you can, you, you get a little practice in when you're dealing with a family or if you're dealing with, you know, a local community, something like that. But the really big things where you're trying to figure out what's really going on, where you have to pay close attention, where you have to do research, is the current events that are happening around our planet. You know, what's who's lying, who isn't lying. Uh, and you have to learn about these things and you have to have guidance to get you to the point where you can make, you know, correct assessments in the beginning. Because all of that is giving you feedback to this emotional center. Because the emotional center eventually, when it's fully developed, along with the intellectual center, become the eyes of the soul. That's what mm -hmm. wants you to see the unseen. So, you know, you have to, and as he's have said, you know, people who pay, pay close attention to reality, right and left, become the reality of the future. Uh, you know, people who attempt to suppress, overcome, shut out, ignore, you know, do away with, you know, our reality, they, they become a dream in the past. They cease to exist because they, you know, they can't deal with reality. So sometimes it's really, really hard because watching what's going on, I mean, it, you scrolling through Twitter for you know, 20 minutes can, can <laughs> send me to bed with a, you know, a headache. Uh, not anymore. It used to really, really affect me when we first understood this and, and began practicing this because it is a method also of delivering shocks. Right. Because, you know, shocks are what you need and being able to be rational in the, in the presence of a shock is extremely important to not go off, you know, fly off the handle or, or get crazy from it, to be able to sit with it. And sometimes it burns, it burns, it burns. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I can't, you know, I almost can't bear this. So those are the things that work to help to make you immune and like you were saying it, it's kind of like a, a form of immunity people who really are good at their sports people who do military training uh people who do hard jobs where you have to use a lot of mind over matter that is you know control over your physical body to force yourself to do this to work long hours to work hard to do things that are you know beyond your capabilities even sometimes and push yourself those are things that, that that build you know build something inside you that is something to work with yeah obviously like i said you need more you need what's going on here and you need you know some particular esoteric type exercises but <clears throat> those are really good beginnings i mean my, my dad used to call it intestinal fortitude yeah guts yeah <laughs> And, and that's, that's what you have to have, and you have to have control. So, and it is protective. Awareness is protective. And when you don't, when you know something is being beamed at you, when you know it and you feel it and you feel crazy, that's when you need your network because that's when you need to talk. Right. You know, you need to, everybody needs to talk and discuss it because the more you talk about it, the less power it has over. And I don't know if you've ever noticed that. That's a, that's a profound awareness. And that's something that I've known always, but I've dealt with debates and arguments from other people who don't want to talk about things. Mm. No, you should know there, there should be no topics that can't be talked about. That's exactly right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, some people What's, process obviously data differently and I'm not making yeah. excuses for them, but you know, like some people just like, they have to go to sleep. They're like, oh, let me sleep on this and yeah. then we can talk about it in the morning. 
Every, everybody's got a different way of processing. Some people are kinesthetic. Some people are visual. Some people are auditory. I mean, two are, you know, my, my loosely adopted daughter is a linguist. And she has the most incredible auditory memory of anybody I've ever known. And she, you know, speaks multiple languages. I mean, she can... She can hear this. I mean, I gotta wear freaking hearing aids to be able to hear normal speech. And I can't even understand my own kids when they talk too fast. You know, I mean, again, those are little, 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 what did you say? <laughs> what's up? You know, what do you mean? What's up? What is that? Okay, so so it so unpacking this further within the frame of what we're talking about before I move into another topic, we know we're in the middle of the wave. We also know based on transhumanism and the singularity and all these nonsensical transmogrification recommenders, you know, I could name names, but I won't. We, we all agree that we don't have 30 years. So, so where are we? And I, and I know time is fluid and, you know, the, 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 the dynamics outside of third density don't even relate to time because it doesn't exist. But if we were to make a prediction and I know the seeds are never going to give the answer because obviously, again, it's fluid and it's based on decisions and collective consciousness rising and all this stuff. But like, where are we on the actual timeline and third density of whatever is going to happen with the wave happening? Do you think it's 10 years or under? I'd say within 10 years. Yeah. That's what I think too. Hunter, you think so? I think, I think. Yeah. Well, well, I was going to ask you, Laura, with this, when you go out in public and you see people, so if you go to the grocery store, you see people at the airport, you just see people in public in general. The living do you, dead. Ever get, do you ever get this weird sense that they're not even, I don't know. It's like, like yesterday I, I went to the store because I just moved into a new house. So I needed a new, a few new things. And like the cashier, my interactions with the people at the store were so bizarre it was like they weren't real humans. And I know like if you took a pulse, they would be beating, but it was like, I was in this weird like haze state where I was like trying to communicate with them normally. And their reality set was so different. They seemed so numb to what was going on. And I guess the point is, I don't know if those people will be able to exist in the next 10 years. So long. It, yeah. In the sense of like functioning, experiential intelligence more or less they were just like automatons yes that was yesterday they I, I mean i couldn't have asked them if i asked them like hey like how are you feeling today they would have just been like uh what you know you're you'll, you'll get to where you can accommodate this better i mean in the beginning 20 years ago when i would go to the store all i could see was people who were unaware that they were literally food right and one way or another, that they were literally food, either psychically, emotionally, or, you know, some of them in some cases actually physically, ultimately. And it was so depressing and it was so disorienting because like you just said, you know, you feel like you're, you feel like you're, there's a veil or something, you know, or between you and them and you have trouble talking to them. You will accommodate them. Uh, the, the the Sufi Shaikh Ibn Al Arabi he would call this being in a state. You get in a state where you can you see things and you know things, and they're beyond what other people see and know. After a while, if you keep your cool, the state transforms into what is called a station, and that means that's where you live in that in that respect. And you, you know, I mean, now I, I'm able to, you know, interact with all kinds of people, you know, smile, you know, play the, the little, I, I play dumb a lot. <laughs> we almost have to, because it's like, Jay and I have talked to, about this before. If we go to like, you know, a large family gathering or even not a family thing, but you know, just some event that we have to go to, I don't even like to tell people what I do anymore because it's so far removed from what they even understand when i try to explain it it's it is like confusing and destabilizing them and then it makes them feel weird when i start talking yeah. about things 
And so it just it ends up being like you leave it and it's like a sour interaction, not because anybody was mad or whatever, but it was like it was so far beyond the bounds of like what they would understand is like, oh, you're an attorney. You're a real estate agent. You're like in their like box to find thing. It kind of goes back to what we said yesterday in the show of like it, it, you're so far removed from like what most normal people experience. It becomes hard to uh, have conversations and relate to them because they just don't understand where you're operating from. Well, you can you can enter into their uh, into their reality in a way. I mean, almost as a, as an exercise, and you can. I mean, I can do it to a certain extent. I can't do it for a long time, right? Keep draining, but I can. You know, I can do it to a certain extent, and uh, and I'll tell you one of the one of the things that we do to lighten up. <laughs> you got <to> crack up. <laughs> We do karaoke. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can really make a fool of yourself and, you know, and you can pretend to be a rock star or whatever you want to be and get into this whole thing and, and play at it. And, and also singing is, is, you know, creates limbic resonance, if, resonance, especially if you sing together with other people, you know, and then you can kind of, and that kind of helps to lift a lot of this oppressive, depressive thing. Um, but you, yeah, you'll get used to it. It takes a while and you have to keep reading and studying. And, and, and you also have to spend time talking to other people that are kind of like on the same wavelength because that helps you feel normal. I mean, if I remember the first time, the first time we had a meeting of all the people that were reading the wave uh, was in Florida. And we we rented a hotel, you know, for a meeting, and all these people were came from all over the world. And they came into this big meeting room, and they started talking to each other, and it became a roar. I mean, yeah. I was standing back there listening. To these they were so thrilled to be able to talk to somebody, and to be able to relate. And it just and it just went on and on and on and it went on for like for the three days of the meeting. That was the frequency of resonance. Yeah, they they just they just talked and and they and it was just it was great. That, that's kind of the way Hunter and I are now, Laura. I mean, and and by the way, I wanted something that you said that actually triggered me, and it was like, oh my god, it was the code of awareness, the Castaneda moment when you said, "I can only go for so long." without being drained and it hit me it was like when we're actually with them the, the they're being as as etheric food so are we and that's the draining <laughs> holy shit so when we talk about how oh they just drain me when we're around these people it's because they are such food sources that we're in the same general general vicinity or energy field and guess what? It ain't stopping to you. No, you have to be really, really aware. And and you can only maintain that kind of awareness. Oh, my God. For a, a period of time because, you know, you get tired. Yeah. Your brain gets yeah. tired. You're, you're, you get tired. I mean, what does the C say? It says it, it taxes the soul to be embodied. And that's why we have to sleep. Because when yeah. we sleep, you know, our soul recharges. <clears throat> well, with that too, I remember reading something. I, I don't remember what book, but I think they mentioned something about organic portals basically don't charge from the same source that we charge. Because when we go to sleep, we our soul charges, but then their source charge comes from our source charge. So they're like trying to get into our field to like suck that out that like we got from our own sleep. And they're like going around looking for us to like, get their charge if that makes sense. So Laura, do you think your ex-husband was an organic portal and he was just literally charging off of you at all time? It's a real possibility. Um I know he he had a diagnosed personality disorder. I mean di professionally diagnosed. And I've just blew it off at the time. You know, you can get over that. Uh but only it only later did I realize because the whole time I was married to him, I just kept getting weaker and sicker, right. and sicker and sicker and weaker and sicker. And, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it takes a lot just to keep me, 
for somebody who, who who suffers so much, I have the greatest blood work on the planet. I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, as I told you, you know, my ex, my wife's ex-husband was exactly your, your situation. I mean, it's it, it, the uncanny aspect of it is it's startling. Um, and even my ex-wife who I have now, um, you know, amicable relationship with, um, was, there were a lot of similarities too. So I almost kind of feel like it's part of our path to encounter these people, whether it's, you know, through a marriage or a, a, a business relationship or something where we do have to learn through that too. And, and, and part of it is the siphoning where you eventually get to a point of like, I cannot do this anymore. I know reading your book and, you know, the, the parts where you finally were like, it's, it's over. And, you know, my, my wife talks about how she, I mean, she literally was the breadwinner and she just abandoned because he wouldn't, she served in paperwork and he wouldn't, you know, acknowledge the paperwork. This is in California. So good luck. Right. But like all of these things, eventually she was just like, I literally extricated myself from the situation. I told my oldest son who was, you know, very partial to her. The other two were, t were just, you know, 10, 11. Um, that what was going to happen. And she's like, I had to physically remove myself from the situation because it was, it was, it was it, I felt like it was no hope. I couldn't escape. You know, it was like she was losing air. Yeah. It's true. I mean, I knew I was going to die. I knew it just as sure as I knew anything. And, you know, it's just, you know, my art had a way worse situation than than I did. And it was, uh, you know, well, those are, those are the things where when you finally see something, you know, it's very, very hard to hold that vision of you're seeing something that's unseen. Right. Yeah. I mean, come on, for God's sakes, when I separated from my ex-husband, even my dentist was saying to me, he's such a nice guy. <laughs> And he had, you know, my mouth was open and ears and around and I can't. <laughs> Are you crazy, girl? You know? And yeah. So because every he was the nicest. I mean, he would just give you the shirt off his back, you know, for anybody except the camera. It's crazy to think about. I still think, I know we talked about this, but I still think about the time you said you went to the bathroom in the middle of the night and he was like in a trance being talked to by like the masters, the overlords or whatever. And I'm thinking, Christ. I mean, because, you know, I don't think I told you this, but my wife's situation was he would always say, if it's not in the Bible. And then obviously, you know, in book six, you know, where you were talking about how the CIA has like used the Bible programming or the fundamentalist Christian programming to teach people to literally say that like a robot, like a broken record. Yeah. And that it's all through society. And so like, I remember reading that and my wife's story of her telling me that he would say that to her and dude, I literally went sheet white, dropped the book and was like, oh my God, there's another example. Hunter, remember I texted you. I was like, Holy yeah, God. yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting question too, about what was going on in the sixties and seventies with a lot of those televangelists that would say stuff. And then you had a lot of these people that were just what that was probably a revival too, of just, they would like get entranced into whatever they were saying. And then you have a lot of people now within, you know, within Christianity that just, it's this very, very like cognitive wall that they can't go up to. And it's like, Nope, <clears throat> not true. And then you have this whole academic establishment <laughs> that feeds them that too, you know, in the United States that I've seen in colleges and universities and seminaries and all these things that like propagate it. And then they're like, it, it gives them validation. Cause they're like, well, yeah, this guy's a professor and he wrote about it and everything. And then they never just pull the wool all over their eyes. Yeah. Well, I think there, there are, like I said, there's a lot of programming that goes on. That's just normal fam familial social programming that sets us up and it's put it's propagated by you know educational systems you know or religious systems and then there are people you know obviously selected out to be uh picked up and taken into some of these secret government mind control programming things and we see a lot of that being activated nowadays mass shootings and so on and so forth and um 
those people can be turned on by hearing, you know, words. I mean, when you you read about the green bomb thing, you know, oh, that was incredible stuff. And then, you know, and then I, not too long after that, I did that hypnosis session with that, that girl who had supposedly been raped by reptoids. And then she, you know, I started getting into the questions about, you know, the programming and there's this whole robotic thing, you know, access denied, access denied. And I mean, I was getting creeps. I mean, I needed had to get out my hairspray again. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, well, you know, you, you joke about this. We used to, we used to talk about the fact that, you know, that was a two can of hairspray, you know, event. And we would even joke about wearing holsters, you know, for our hairspray. So you could whip it out really quick, you know, <laughs> keep your hair from standing up on end. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of programming going on and there's a lot of uh, ordinary programming, social, familial programming, and it's all, it's all coming to a head. Right now, I mean, it's coming to a head. It's 2014. What, what do you think? What do you think? Will, and this is just a projection, but you know, because we obviously all agree, it's we don't have 10 years until whatever, whatever we want to call the realm border crossing is the the, the hyperdimensional spatial crossing. I mean, you know, in the books, the seas talk about how it's basically two. The third density realm is left behind, and the fourth density realm is just in another level. Right. And obviously service to other service to self. But do you see this year with the election coming? Do you th I mean, there's so much disinformation and so much speculation, but what, what do you think will happen? Do you think there will be an election? I think there will be an election, but I think that uh, what happens after the election is going to be. I mean, if Trump gets elected, there will be violence and if Trump Chaos. gets elected. There will be violence, uh, and it's you know I don't see any way out of it because th those in control are really desperate to keep that control, right? And those that are wanting to do away with those in control are getting more and more angry. I mean, the average person there there's is the amount of anger that is building up inside the human population is, is really scary. That's another reason I scan Twitter. You know, I want to see what people are saying and thinking. And well, did a, you see there's a movie coming literally in April called civil war? I think what we need is a revolution, not a civil war. Right. Right. And yeah. you know, that, uh, there is not, there's a fine distinction between them, but the revolution would be against the uh, the, the elite, the power mongers. The civil war would be people against each other, and I don't, yeah. I don't see unless there's a whole lot more suffering and waking up of more people. I don't see how we can even avoid the civil war aspects of it because there are so many brainwashed, yeah, uh, people that you know that they will just support the elites no matter what, even to their own death and detriment. I mean, for God's sakes, they're sacrificing their children to them. Right. right. <clears throat> so, I mean, they'll support them to the death. I always think it's funny you have, call them American patriots, that venerate the American Revolution as this amazing thing that happened. And yet, if the same thing were happening today, they would go to death to support whatever the United States is now, which is more or less a fraud. They would go to death to support that because of the belief system that they've installed. When any critical thinker would obviously look at the machinations behind our government in the United States and say, well, that's obviously corrupt. It's obviously unfair. It's obviously all these things. Um, I don't know what the solution is in terms of having a revolution. We have obviously need one but i just think it's funny because it's the same people that would say that are the ones that would like think that the united states is something worthy of upholding <laughs> well there was a small moment in time where it was right you know but you know as with anything corruption creeps in at a very early stage and then it it, it worms its way in and but for a long time it's behind the scenes 
at this point, it's all out in the open. I mean, we have Trump to thank for that because, you know, it, it all came out in the open. Um, but yeah, I think there was, and, and, you know, we can't abstract ourselves from reality in which we live because that is, that is making a choice. Right. Um, there are people who are suited for marching and fighting. That's not me. And there are people who are suited for other purposes, but they can all still have the same ideas and ideals. Um, I mean, you know, if I was younger, I'd probably be, you know, marching. And if I didn't have children, I'd be out there marching and carrying signs and that sort of thing. But uh, I'm 72 years old, you know. I mean, my day for prancing around in that way is, is long gone. But I can certainly encourage people to look at the truth to see and, and make their own decision as to whether they want to take some kind of action on behalf of it. What do, you, what do you think happened with Trump at the end of 2020? I mean, because I can make a really compelling argument that he had the greatest presidency. It was the greatest presidency ever in what was accomplished. It, it, it seemed like there were... He really tried uh, to fulfill all of his campaign promises. Well, yeah, but I mean, what, what I was going to say was that what happened was almost... No, it's, it, 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 it's almost like so much happened from a positive standpoint, but then it all just like shifted at the end with the whole, you know, obviously January 6th debacle and just obviously the, the election was stolen and hijacked. You know, I mean, there, you know, there's been thousands of people. So January 6th was a complete CIA op. It was right. Like, man, and it was kind of like, uh, manipulated and maneuvered by Nancy Pelosi and all of her gang. Sure. And, you know, that's, you know, Trump is not perfect. That's I mean, for sure. He, he had some advisors he should never have had, but he was really kind of politically innocent when he went in. He really, I don't think he really knew how bad it was. And how right. He knew, he knew there was a swamp. Well, it's, this is more than just a swamp. This is like, you know, the pit of hell. That's what's going yeah. on in Washington. And well, well, the seas have told us that Washington is, D.C. is the capital. The STS capital. Of Fort Density Consortium, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so, well, we'll see what happens. I mean, I I tend to, you know, take a more, let's see what's going, let's do what we can in every moment, send out our signals as much as we can, or, you know, do all of our, do all of our work. Uh, make ourselves as ready as possible for whatever happens and then wait and see what happens. The, it's the old prepare for the worst, hope for the best and take what comes. So that's what we need to be doing. Well, my, I, just so you know, and you both of you don't know this, but I decided all this last night, but uh, this, th these podcasts are going to run for six weeks in a row. So I'm going to start them like the second week of May and it'll run through like the third third or fourth week going into the fourth week of june so i mean obviously we're going to be doing our part in putting this information out there um and i think that's far enough in advance of like what is to come i mean i you know back to what you were saying about people waking up i mean it's a yes and no thing for me you know because obviously again they tell us that so many people are waking up Right. But you and I know, and all three of us know that when you go out in public, that's the furthest thing from the truth. And then there's also the levels of awakening, right? Because there are some people who are waking up in some ways. Exactly. And then let's just call them newbie awakened. They are angry, right? Yeah. Because when you first waken, you want justice. <laughs> we got to get revenge. We got to strike back. We've got to do whatever it is. Right. And it's like, no, bro. Like, or, you know, you, there's levels to this. So it, it's, it's a very interesting time. Like you said, we're in the middle of the wave. We are, and everything is coming to a head and it's doing it all at once. And it's, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. I mean, I'm not going to, has to, I'm not going to lie to anybody. And there's going to be a lot more suffering. And I think people in the U S are going to, uh, and I'm, you know, heck, 
France is not much different. I'm not going to say yeah. too much because you got to be careful what you say. Right. But you can, you, you can read between the lines there. I often yeah. say that France and the U.S. are a lot alike. Well, I mean, I mean, really, isn't the Eurozone, the U.K., the United States and Canada are pretty much all fourth density consortium strongholds? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> It's, uh, is there any? Is there anywhere in the world that isn't Russia? Yeah, <clears throat> Russia. How, how possible would it be for people like us to just pick up and move and move to Russia? Like, what would the resistance barrier be like? Because I've never really heard anybody. I mean, I have a lot of friends who are digital nomads and you know lived all over the world, and I've. I've gone everywhere. I mean, I've looked in Puerto Rico. I've looked in Latin America. Obviously, my wife and I lived in Mexico for almost a year um, at different alternative, you know, places because obviously we knew it was coming and is still coming. And now I'm back here in Florida. But is, I mean, is it possible for people like us to actually pick up and move to Russia without uh, hindrance? Yes. Hmm. Because you have people in your group from Russia, correct? Yes. Yes, uh, Gabby has a Russian passport. Wow. She, in fact, uh, drove down to Marseille yesterday to cast her vote at the Russian consulate. That's very cool. I think it's. I think it's interesting. I was reading in one of your your books. I forgot which one, and. Uh, it was talking about capitalism versus communism. <laughs> I think it was maybe 2 billion people or something died at the hands of government and political tyranny or something like that. But actually it skews, I'm not saying communism is good by any means, but it skews in favor of capitalism that more people have been killed by capitalist uh, governments or, you know, structure, power structures or whatever, as opposed to communism. Well, you know, I, I thought about that a lot at one point, and I came to the conclusion that uh, the problem is people are looking looking at the wrong scale. Communism is a very good system for a family or a small tribe, you know, uh, or a soul family, whatever, where, you know, they all work and to each according to his need or from each according to his ability and all that sort of thing. That's a family. But then when you have you know, tribe to tribe interactions, you know, then you need a little more, something more like socialism, like, you know, a small town or something, you know, where each tribe contributes a certain amount <clears throat> to a, kind of a pool to take care of the, you know, the social needs, like, you know, roads and parks and whatever, all this kind of stuff, medical care, make sure that medical care is available to all. In capitalism, it is a very good system between larger entities like countries, you know, where you sell and compete in a market and you produce, you know, the, the, the goods that are produced maybe communistically in a tribe are then sold up to the socialistic group or, and then they sell them up to the commun uh, the capitalistic group, which is country to country. That's not an exact uh, breakdown of it, but that was what I thought because communism is great in families, but it's not good for a country. Socialism has many advantages. I mean, the socialized medicine in France is, and, and French people tell me that it has deteriorated. And to me, it's like, you know, unbelievably efficient and, and competent. And, uh, you know, you get absolutely the, I mean, like when, when our kid is lymphoma, you know, there is a research hospital in Toulouse, which is 40 kilometers away which is the best hospital for his type of lymphoma in the world. He was taken there. He got first class care. The meals were good, even, <laughs> in this place. And he just got the best care that you could ever possibly, and everybody was wonderful and kind and friendly and all, all that kind of stuff. And I think we paid $80. Wow. <laughs> Seven months of chemotherapy. Yeah, I mean, you can't get you can't get a a sandwich at a hospital for eighty dollars in the United States. And if you did, it would be a shitty sandwich. <laughs> I and I mean, you know, I have this little issue going on here, and I've had, I mean, from 
in a week, in a week's time, in seven days' time, I've had three high-level technical, you know, tests done, and I haven't paid anything. Yeah. I mean, I pay my copay insurance, which is right. terrible. It's like it's like nine hundred euros a year. A year. Right. Not a month. And you know, everything else is and and if you get a prescription, you know, everything is covered, your medicines are free or whatever, you know, paid for by by your insurance or your whatever. And when my son had he had multiple surgeries and he had to go into a he had to go to a hyperbaric chamber for um you know healing his surgical wounds and there's a, a big one down in Toulouse and it was prescribed the ambulance would come to the door every day he would get in the ambulance they would take him to the hospital in Toulouse he would get out he'd go in the hyperbaric chamber then they would bring him home and it was all paid for and after he got out, got out of the hospital, truck comes to our door or to the gate out front and unloads this huge mongoose box full of dressings and tape and, and you know, all kinds of special stuff to take care of his surgical wounds. It's all paid for. Wow. And it's first class care. And, he, and it's, you know, it's not like that system in UK you know, where, I mean, their system is just, you know, what do they call it, NHS or something like that. It's really horrible because Joe's parents exist under that regime. And there have been many times they have come to France to see a doctor because they couldn't get an appointment for six months. Wow. So, you know, and, and France has the best doctors. I mean, they really are excellent, excellent doctors. I can't say enough for it. So, I mean, I, and the roads are well repaired. Right. It works along the auto routes, you know, beaches, you know, the, the centers of towns, well cared for, clean flowers. I mean, France is a very beautiful country. And a lot of that is because of socialism. But it doesn't compete well in the international market because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take the capitalistic spirit where it ought to go because capitalism is a capitalism encourages innovation and it, it encourages competition. Those things are good for getting things better and more and better. You know, the French are maybe a little too used to their socialistic system because they don't, they don't uh, compete and develop things like they used to. They're, they've become complacent. Yeah. So, Anyway, on capitalism, communism, and, and so forth. There's, there's it's ways. just, I've always wondered why there's, at this time on the earth, a thousand years ago, there's the same amount of resources, but it's just always how those resources get distributed or are distributed differently. So it's, it's funny because the way I think a lot of people think about money is that they never have enough, at least here in the United States, is like they always just have enough to pay their bills so they don't get kicked out and they don't get things repossessed. But it's like, there's the same amount of money or call it resources that have always existed, but it seems like the game is to keep people to where it's just enough. And they just are like, the carrot is like dangling right in front of them. And it seems like with capitalism, that's always the case. Cause like, if you just work a little bit harder, if you just do a little bit more extra, you'll get it. So yeah, capitalism, it's got some downsides and it would need to be, regulated somewhat but not over regulated i mean uh, i don't know May maybe i'm too american you know because you know well i, I mean i mean does i think you're right I, I i but i think the argument really is now that capitalism has almost outserved its purpose now too because there's such a differentiation in humans you've got the aware versus the unaware and there's a lot of unaware people that are still benefiting in capitalism. And so it's kind of like a, it's almost a parasitic thing in and of itself. Well, the problem with it and the problem with everything everywhere actually is that there is no real awareness of psychopathology and how it infiltrates systems and how right. it breaks systems. 
right. how it hurts people and families. I mean, it's just, I, I spent, that was the one good thing about all those crazy people that were attacking us way back when, is it forced me to begin to study psychopathology. And I spent like 10 years, and I mean, I, you know, I read textbooks, papers, you know, all kind, every kind of book, you know, trying to get inside this whole thing and wrote a lot of stuff about it. And we published political ponderology because, you know, because of that work that I was doing. And if people were aware of that, and if there were some kinds of safeguards that were put in place to eliminate that problem from our society, um, I think a lot of things would work a lot better without a whole lot of regulations. True. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if there is a egalitarian, quote unquote, political system or economic system that we could really ever, you know, put into third density, because like you said, by, by our very nature in third density, we're service to self. We have to breathe. We have to eat. Yeah. So yeah. there's always going to be differentiation. There's always going to be class separation. There's always going to be better. I think, best. I think looking at who we are and what we are and, and the fact that we are souls that occupy uh, genetic bodies. And these genetic bodies have certain tendencies and, and uh, ways of being that are, that are part of uh, an evolutionary history. And there, you know, evolution is operative, in, in my opinion, in a modified way. It's not quite the way the neo-Darwinists or the Darwinists would like to think it is, but, you know, it, it clearly operates. And if we understood ourselves, our, our machine, you know, the body, as we ought to, and understood the interaction between the soul and the machine, I think we could make a lot of positive changes because you know i mean things like understanding that men are a certain way genetically and women are a certain way genetically and th there's a, a broad range of what they can do i mean I'm, I'm not saying that women can't be jet pilots or that men can't be nurses or whatever you know clearly they can i mean that's not an issue but there are issues about their you know, their genetic proclivities that need to be taken into account. And once those things are taken fully into account and the understanding of psychopathology in our, uh, in our gene pool and OPs even, I think, you know, I think that something could be established that would, that would work at least for longer than anything else has. I mean, but, but, but maybe it will work once fourth density service to others occurs. I mean, again, I don't want to like put the apple, put the court before the heart, the, the cart before the horse, but maybe that's literally what does naturally and organically evolve. Yeah. And it may, I mean, you know, we, we, we uh, talk about it a lot on our forum. We discuss all those kinds of things. And we discuss, you know, male and female relationships and family relationships and how they could and should be. And we do a lot of, of reading, uh, you know, trying to find examples that, that we can hold up. And, our, you know, our favorite, our favorite author for how men and women should interact together is Mary Bell. Mary who? I'm sorry. Mary Balog. Balog. B-A-L-O-G-H. And she writes romance novels, but these novels are very psychological, very intense. I mean, a lot of really, I mean, you just pick one up one day. And I know men don't read psychological romance, but you I actually, I used to at one time. You I always say the best way for men to understand women's psychology is to read romance novels. That He's will teach you more than a woman will ever tell you herself. <laughs> She's got a series called Survivors, or the Survivors, and it's about these men, and one of them is, a, or two of them are women who are horribly traumatized or injured some way in the Napoleonic Wars. And, mm -hmm. 
you know, how they deal with this and how they find people who come into their lives that help them. And one of them lost an arm, you know, one of them loses his vision, you know, one, one is, is so psychologically, psychologically destroyed that he, you know, can hardly do anything. So, you know, it, it, they're really, really interesting. Yeah. I, 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 to, to Hunter, what he was saying, I'm not kidding you. When I was seven, I, I was like you, Laura, I was a prolific reader, but I, when I was seven, I started reading my mom's McCall's and Red Book and all of her women's magazines. I'm serious. I probably learned more about sex and, you know, romance and relationships from reading those magazines at six or seven or eight. I, I mean, I literally, it was, I know it was seven. I'm precocious. You what? Say it again. That's precocious. I was reading all of those magazines. And that's how I learned. I mean, I mean, but you know, as Hunter and I, or I don't know if we talked about this yesterday, but I mean, Laura, no one reads today it is the most yeah, sad, disconcerting. I mean, I forced my daughters to read and both of my daughters are very bright, but it's just not part of culture anymore. It's like they have literally removed it from culture to read. Well, they even say, I mean, they're even teaching people or te teaching kids at schools now that reading and being interested in that sort of thing is is white supremacy. No. <laughs> Mathematics is white supremacy. Laura, the average person, I'm not kidding you, because Hunter and I talk about this every day, the average person that follows us, all of us, not you, but us, like in our you know fitness and biohacking realm, can't string together two coherent sentences. And these are very accomplished people. These are, you know, six figure wage earners, you know, quote unquote, making it in the American of the American way. And they cannot write because they don't read. It's just listen to videos, watch, you know, like you said, sound bites on TikTok, Instagram. It, it, it's, it's, it's madness, like deciphering what they're attempting to say when they correspond with us, when they send us queries, it's insane. I know. I, know. I, I sent Jay literally, I got a question this week and I, it was only like two lines of text long on the screen and I could not understand anything that the guy was actually asking me. I, I was like, I, it was astonishing. Was like, how, what even does that in, mean for their minds though? Like, like, like maybe this is the question and we'll finish today with this. Like what is going on in people's minds that they can't conjugate cogently a thought in written form to send to another human being asking a question? Well, I think uh, there's a, a lot that's revealing in what people write about their inner landscape. And I mean, it's like, in, in a way, it's like making your bed. You know, if you make your bed, you know, even if your room is dusty, it doesn't look too bad. The that's right. Bed is made. I mean, you don't have to be a perfectionist, but just for God's sake, make your bed. And people don't make their beds, you know, so they don't make their beds in their mind, right? See, and their inner landscape, and and that that's another thing. They do studies on personality disorders, where they study the writings and the language, or you know, even the language from interviews that's been transcribed, and they discover that a lot of people who have personality disorders. Uh, they they use what they call mal malapropisms, so they use the wrong word. They think it sounds like the word they want to use, but it's not really the right word. Uh, <clears throat> you know, like uh, he ravaged her when they really mean ravished. See, right. and and they don't even understand the difference. And, that, and that's the simplest one that comes to mind. But there's a lot of those. And people who who are so poorly educated, and that's the educational system, and they have engineered people to be dumb. Right. They have engineered them to be dumb. I mean, uh, the closing of the American mind, you know, the the uh, the failure of the American educational system. My grandmother had an eighth grade education, and she was more educated than college graduates. I have. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I mean, Hunter and I talk about that all the time now, you know, and Hunter's only 31, they're almost 31, right? You're almost 31. And so, but like college kids and I'm, you know, for my, for the purposes of the show, I'm 53. 
So it's a perfect mix of, of, of age in this conversation. But like the kids under the age of 25 who are graduating from college today are almost functionally illiterate. Yeah. They're graduating from college unable to, they have no grasp of history because as you know, history has been audited slash edited out. They don't learn history. They don't know anything about the wars or about, you know, the mentality of people that suffered through the great depression. They don't understand any of these things, but it's, it's really bizarre when you talk to people who are of that age group. And obviously I have children of that age group and, you know, my wife's youngest daughter is about to graduate from college. And she goes to a, ja a, a Nazarene school in San Diego called Point Loma. And it's a lot different than the public schools, which, as you know, are now bastions of just inculcation, of, of just liberal mind control. So she's in a little bit of a different place. But she even tells us that most of the kids don't write long, you know, structural papers or dissertations or any of that stuff because they don't read. And so it's like... You know, I think Hunter and I know this, like we learn this from people that we work with. Laura, I'm not kidding you. Like when you write today, like for example, what you wrote on Twitter, profound, but they would tell you to space your sentences because the, uh, not that you care because younger people don't matter, but I mean, for what you're speaking out there, but like it's called Hunter, we learned this, it's called a copy wall. So if they see more than one cent together, they just like out, opt out. I'm constant over this. There's too much. There's if they see much. a paragraph with more than three to four sentences, they just won't read it anymore. Like Can you imagine? <laughs> I've read sentences that were entire pages or several pages long. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Not one piece of punctuation in the entire So every email that we send out, Laura, now is double spaced. Every single sentence is double spaced. Something else about this that's really troubling. The U.S. is setting itself up to think that it's going to enter a war economy. Right. But who are they going to get to do the work? <laughs> no one. Have, I, you ever, have, you ever seen, have you ever seen the movie A Day Without a Mexican? Did you ever see that movie? I don't watch movie. <laughs> the real I mean, it's kind of funny. It's like idiocracy, but it's basically like they're they're portraying like how fast the average indus industrial uh, supply chain and business uh, structure of the U.S. would collapse if there were no Mexicans because they literally do all of the menial jobs, work, you know, janitorial cl cleaning. I mean, they do the work. And their own country, they get so ripped off, you know. I remember I being in Mexico, and we're riding on the uh, riding on this from Mexico City to Alapa, and we go along, and I'm seeing all of these massive miles and miles and miles of fields of beautiful vegetables, you know. And yet in Mexico City, there are people running around, you know, the, the kids, the street kids, and beggars, and you know, don't have anything to eat. And I'm thinking they're growing all of this because they're sending it to the U.S. You know, yeah. and it just, it just, it horrified me. It's disheartening. Yeah. So yeah. what the U.S. is going to do when they get a war going with Russia, I have no clue because they don't have anybody in the U.S. or very few people with enough brains to put any kind of munitions together. The, the Army and the Navy and the Air Force and the Marines have become complete jokes with all of their transgender ideology. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be a slaughter. That's Seems cool. so. No brains and no brawn, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Russia is looking better all the time. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. It's a terrible thing to say. Right. It's incredible to think about like how mind controlled and manipulated people are. Um, what did you think, by the way? Final just by, kind of bonus before we end. What did you think of the interview between um uh what the Russians, uh, what, what's his name? So Tucker um, Carlson and Putin. Tucker, Tucker Carlson and, and of, of course, uh, the Russian. Vladimir Putin. Vladimir yeah. Um, Well, Tucker, is, you know, was a complete American and he didn't understand that, that, you know, Putin, Putin is an extremely educated man. Right. 
is, and he's also a very compassionate man. And he, you know, he wanted to give a lesson that there is something that is, you know, longer and older than, you know, just 200 years of American history. And he had a point that he wanted to make about um, Ukraine and the fact that it has only been in fairly recent times that it even thought it was a country. Right. No, it's always been a region. And it was, you know, kind of like a, a region of original Russianness at some point in time. I mean, it's very, very ancient. So separating itself off and calling itself a different country is, is, is a fairly recent innovation. And, you know, making that, and he was making that point that basically what, what, what you people have done is you caused brother to fight against brother here. And that was, and he was really, he's, he's upset about it. He's sad about it. I think Putin was quite surprised to learn how, uh, how slimy and disreputable American politicians are. I think he had the idea he was probably subjected to the same American propaganda that everybody else has been. You know, America, a great country on earth, streets are paved with gold, democracy, liberty, etc. And, you know, all the while that that's been propagated for years and years and years, there's been the CIA in the background, you know, doing some of the filthiest, dirtiest, nastiest tricks all over the globe that you could even possibly imagine. And then in doing experiments on their own people and uh, mind control experiments and, and controlling politics. And there's Israel, you know, this is controlling the media, controlling politics, controlling American politicians and so forth. So he had the idea that, you know, the propaganda was possibly some of the truth. I mean, I'm sure he knew somewhat better because, come on, he was a KGB agent. He can't be stupid. But I think he was really surprised at how filthy and backstabbing and backbiting America actually turned out to be. And I'm not sure if he fully realizes that this has only been since the Kennedy assassination, because that's when they really started coming out and doing things in a vile and vicious way where you could actually see them if you were looking. It's not quite as open as it is now, but it was still apparent. Um, so he had the idea that, you know, he could deal with America. And when he saw what America was actually doing, he realized quite painfully, I think, that America wanted to steal Russia. They wanted to basically own it, to own its resources, to destroy its population, to Americanize them. And of course, that means all the things that Americans are experiencing today, you know, transgenderism, right. and uh, DEI, which is probably the worst thing. And that's another thing that's going to destroy America is diversity, equity, and inclusion, because completely incompetent individuals are being put into positions right. where they should never be. And that is that is bringing America down to to the level of below a banana republic. So, yeah, I thought it was an interesting interview. Putin said afterwards that he uh, he thought that Tucker, you know, could have asked some more hard hitting questions, but uh, uh, Tucker just likes to sit down and talk and let people reveal themselves if possible. But he also does tend to be a little bit gullible. Do you think Tucker is an agent of the CIA? He's just a, he's a controlled disinformer. No, no, I think he's a sincere guy, but I, like I said, I think he's gullible. Yeah. Well then the only other final question I have, and then we'll end this one and I'll see you, see you again for five and six is, um, the seas have told us there's only been one global government now that all of these, you know, regional governments, Russia, China, USA, they, you know, the UK, the, you know, uh, Scandinavia, Asia, Middle East, they're all just for show. I mean, is that still true or is there like I arms? I don't think so. I think that that was, was the way things were at the time that question was asked, which was back in what? In the 90s. In the 90s, yeah. I, You know, a lot has happened in Russia since then. There's been a lot of awakening and even more so 
since they've had to deal with the U.S. and, and the Ukraine situation. And I think that it was, you know, just a, an absolute fluke or a, a benevolence bestowed upon the planet that, that, you know, Putin was made president and he turned out to be the kind of decent person he is. Because if you look back, you can't find anybody who says anything, who really knows him, who says anything bad about him. You know, it's just, it just isn't there. And then, of course, since uh, since Trump has been uh, in, in in the presidency and then subsequent to that, that's when all of the really filthy, dirty dealing in the U.S. has been, you know, just completely exposed. And also that has generated similar exposure in other countries such as the U.K., Ireland, France, Germany, Italy. You know the various other countries that are under the uh, the U.S. domination, um, but you just see it all goes back to the U.S. because if they had they had any sense whatsoever, and I, in fact, one of the reasons that we moved to France was because France refused to participate in the first Iraq war or the, the second Iraq war. Uh, you know, I just didn't want to stay in the U.S. in a country that would preemptively attack a country that had never done anything to them and wasn't doing anything to them and didn't plan on doing anything to them and go in there and bomb their cities to oblivion and kill over a million civilians. You know, it just, I mean, that hadn't happened when we left, but I could see, I could see it was going to happen. And I said, Oh my God, I can't stand this. It's terrible. I don't believe in this, you know, and come on. I mean, I'm, I descend from multiple, multiple lines of, of, Revolutionary War soldiers. <laughs> so, I mean, making that decision wasn't easy. But the yeah. US, it's not what it used to be. It, it hasn't been. I, I, time. I guess my only thought to file to follow up and then to finish because I know we're, I don't want to keep you go over, but like, I have a little bit of a conflict in my mind with the idea that if fourth density is so powerful how would anyone in third density actually unhook themselves from whatever control and influence that they have? Only a network can do it. Right. Social memory complex. So that's what basically has happened in Russia since Ukraine. You think it's been recent? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, you think about all the insanity that happened during COVID and then how it just all shifted, right? It went all from like, pray for Ukraine. It went from, it went from masks to pray for Ukraine. Yeah. And now it, don't send any more money to Ukraine. Send it to Israel. <laughs> That's a whole other thing. We could actually probably talk about it in the next one. We'll pick up, we'll pick up on Israel on the next, on the next one. Do what? What'd you say? Better not. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> we'll have every every agency and every uh, political action group and we'll do it. We'll do it for the veiled. We'll do it. Yeah, veiled. whatever the okay. ADL is. We have to talk in code. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm Jay Campbell for Hunter Williamson. And of course, Laura. Thank you so much. Uh, we will be back again. This is the end of part four of our episode. Thank you, guys. <laughs>